Hi, everyone. So we'll begin in just a minute. Um, so while we have folks logging on, please consider taking this poll question uh, so that we can know which organization you're representing today. Um, so again, which of the following best describes your organization type? So the target audience for this webinar, again, is usually health centers, primary care associations, and national cooperative agreements, but we welcome all organizations to learn from our speakers and faculty today. So I wanna, again, thank you all for joining. Great, I'm seeing a good amount of FQHCs in the room. So glad to have you all here. And we have some health center guest speakers um, in the lineup today. So hope you can uh, gain some best practices and strategies to take back to your health center. I'll leave the poll open for another 10 seconds. All right, so just gonna share the results for you all. Um, thank you. So we'll go ahead and begin. So hello again, and welcome to today's session and welcome back to those who were able to join us in the last two weeks for webinars number one and two. On behalf of the Special and Vulnerable Populations Task Force, I'd like to welcome you to the third webinar in our four-part national learning series focused on specific areas of diabetes continuum of care framework, which is based on health center feedback from last year's 2019 series. Similar to last week, if you were with us, today's webinar will discuss effective service delivery approaches to improve health literacy and specifically in the context of diabetes prevention, management, and improvement of health outcomes. My name is Albert Eisen, Jr., and I am the Senior Program Manager of Training and Technical Assistance at the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, or APSHO for short, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. I also want to acknowledge my APSHO colleagues, Joe Lee and Christine Alarcon, as well as Jillian Hopewell from the Migrant Clinicians Network, the four of us combined serve as your moderators and behind the scenes organizers for the National Learning Series, which is on its third year and going strong. So before we dive into our curated content for today, I would like to briefly go over our Zoom housekeeping reminders. Um, some of you may have heard this already from our last two webinars. So as attendees on today's webinar, you will have access to certain features um, as you'll see on your control panel. The first is audio. If you click mute and unmute, that allows you to use your microphone. However, to minimize the background noise during the presentation, all attendees are muted upon entry. Um, if you click the up arrow triangle on the right side of the mute and unmute button, uh, that will help you choose specific audio settings for your microphone and speaker setting. And then next we have the Q&A feature. And during the presentation, you may ask questions to us, the panelists, or to each other, the attendees. Uh, simply click Q&A and type your questions into the free text field that you see on your screen. Um, the moderators, organizers, and guest speakers will either send a typed response to your question or will answer it live at the end when we have live Q&A. Um, you all as attendees can also upvote and comment on any of the open questions if you wish. Um, Again, see the example on the screen that just popped up. Um, that'll help us kind of target which questions are the most popular if you upvote or comment. Um, we do have an hour and a half together, so do highly encourage you to uh, monitor and use the chat box window to engage with each other virtually. Uh, it usually helps me stay focused when I'm on a webinar as an attendee. All right, the next feature is the chat. By clicking chat, you will be able to communicate with the panelists again and attendees at any time. Be ready to chat with us during the three open-ended questions we have sprinkled throughout the session. You can also chat with my colleague Christine at um, any point about any troubleshooting issues you're having around Zoom. Um, as you see in your chat box, she's already chatted in some housekeeping as well. So thanks, Christine. Um, for content and speaker-related questions, please use the Q&A pod and not the chat box. That way everyone else sees the questions in a structured format. All right, almost done here. The next feature is the raise hand and lower hand. 
Um, it doesn't get used often, but sometimes it does. If you have a question during the live Q&A portion at the end, you can click raise hand and lower hand so that me, the moderator, can open up your audio. Um, if that fails for some reason, just simply type your question in the Q&A pod and that'll make it easy for me to uh, monitor your question. All right, and then last is in order to leave the webinar, you click leave meeting and you'll be prompted to complete a short post webinar survey, which will get you to SurveyMonkey. Your feedback makes a huge difference as we provide higher quality training and technical assistance to you in the future learning series. Um, it's also important to complete the survey if you are participating in this series for continuing education credits, um, CMEs or CNEs. Um, there's more to come on that in a few slides. And if you have to hop off early, that's a-okay. Uh, we just ask you to take a minute to complete the evaluation. So quickly about the series, this was created to address our nation's diabetes epidemic, which is affecting more than 30 million people across the U.S. today. Um, according to the 2018 UDS or Health Center data, diabetes poses a unique challenge for our health center patients because one in seven patients has diabetes and nearly one in three of those patients has uncontrolled diabetes or A1C greater than nine. To combat and continue the national conversation around diabetes, the Special and Vulnerable Populations Task Force created this learning series to increase your knowledge around effective strategies that prevent, treat, and manage the diabetes of your patients. We also want to acknowledge HRSA's support in our task force efforts to, again, decrease and address the diabetes amongst our vulnerable populations. Speaking of vulnerable populations, um, the 14 task force members that make up the um, series has been crucial in, again, providing the content, the subject matter expertise, and the, the foundation for how health centers can address patients' um, care. The 14 National Cooperative Agreements, or NCAs, are also funded by HRSA and, are, again, are dedicated to different populations from migrant to housing to racial ethnic minorities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've partnered and collaborated for the past three years to create, again, the content and provide access to resources and guest speakers. For more information about us and the partners, you can visit the diabetes um, website at diabetes.apsha.org. Now, it wouldn't be a webinar in this day and age without talking about COVID-19. Um, the task force wants to acknowledge in the forefront that the current pandemic and the changing health center environment um, we're in is really challenging for health centers. So we just want to thank you all and the frontline staff and healthcare providers during this time. As you know, the health centers and the workforce play a vital role in the national response to COVID-19 and part by making patients aware of COVID-19 preventative measures and resources and also sometimes determining if patients need testing and I know some of you might be providing that um, in your various states and regions. So thanks for doing that. Uh, health centers are also coordinating with state and local health departments as part of the emergency response um, efforts. So by continuing to provide primary care and telehealth, you as health centers can relieve the congestion at the hospitals and emergency room departments. Um, we, we want to let all health centers know that the 20 NCA organizations are collating resources around COVID-19 and you can find that at healthcenter.info.org and there's a screenshot available in front of you on the right side um, with the Health Center Clearinghouse logo and drop down menu. You just go to priority topics and that'll link you to COVID-19 and other resources. Um, in relation to this webinar, there's a clear connection between COVID-19 and diabetes that has been communicated from the American Diabetes Association, the CDC, et cetera. Um, people with diabetes are not more likely to get COVID-19 than the general population. However, people with underlying chronic medical conditions like heart, lung disease, or diabetes seem to be at higher risk for developing more serious symptoms and complications when infected with the virus. If one's diabetes is well-managed, the risk of getting severely sick from COVID-19 is about the same as the general population. Um, just to share one recent example I read in the news recently, um, there was talks about how the coronavirus is affecting diabetes patients who are unable to find or buy rubbing alcohol or alcohol swabs. Why is that? Well, people have been panic buying everything from groceries to toilet paper to hand sanitizer and now rubbing alcohol. 
this matters for diabetic patients because they use the rubbing alcohol to disinfect their skin, perhaps when injecting insulin. So just imagine the additional burden on our healthcare system if the diabetic patients are unable to manage their disease and are forced to go to the ER and hospitals, which are overcrowding in some areas. Um, not a good situation. So I hope this is a humble reminder to us all not to panic by and to save those resources for those in need, like our health center patients. All right, so quickly for today's webinar, it'll be recorded and the slides will be made available um, in the follow-up email within the next 24 hours. You can also find those at diabetes.apsha.org. Um, there you will also find the slides and recordings from the first two webinars that were focused on team-based care and understanding health literacy. And going back to the CME and CNE accreditation, some of you may be participating in the entire series so that you can get your continuing education credits. So please take the post-webinar survey that pops up once you exit the webinar. Um, again, the webinar will be um, completed next uh, Tuesday, April 14th. So Martha Alvarado, our colleague at the Migrant Clinicians Network, will be emailing you all an update about the certificates. will be also available a week after April 14th. So expect something around April 21st. If you have additional questions about the CME, CNEs, and continuing education, just please email Martha at malalvarado at migrantclinician.org. Now getting into the content for today, we have three learning objectives as you see on the screen. Uh, the first is to understand the cognitive and social factors that influence health literacy in the context of diabetes management. The second is to describe how enabling services interventions influence patient health literacy and self-management of chronic conditions. Third and last is to identify what other health centers are doing to address health literacy in special and vulnerable populations impacted by diabetes at their organizations. Um, it wouldn't be a series without all my great faculty from the NCAs. So today's session is brought to you by three faculty members who have spent the last few months planning this webinar. First is Gladys Carrillo. She is the manager of health center engagement services for the National Center for Farm Worker Health. She collaborates with health centers to develop tools and programs that will impact operations and overall patient care. Gladys is bilingual and has a background in clinical social work. She graduated summa cum laude with her liberal arts degrees from St. Edwards University and her master's degree in social work from the University of Texas at Austin. Next, we have Dr. Jose Leon, who is chief medical officer for the Center, National Center for Health and Public Housing. In his role, Dr. Leon provides training and technical assistance to community health centers serving public housing residents on emerging clinical topics. Currently, Dr. Leon serves as a member of the American Diabetes Association's Primary Care Working Group and Professional Practice Committee. Last in our faculty is Esli Reyes. Esli joined MHP Salute in July 2018, and she currently provides and is responsible for directing functions and activities of assigned programs and supervising community health workers um, to effectively achieve program and organizational goals. She has experience in planning and implementing community programs with diverse populations and settings, which again, effectively tailors them to meet the community's needs. Um, Ms. Esli Reyes holds a master's in public health degree and bachelor's degree in biomedical sciences, both from Texas A&M University. She is both English and Spanish fluent. Now with our next set of speakers um, who come from the health center space, I wanna start off with Kelly Volkman. Kelly works as the Health Navigation Program Manager for the Community Health Centers of Benson and Lynn Counties in Oregon. Her team of 28 CHWs function as health navigators at multiple sites throughout Benton and Lynn, and Lynn Counties. They help clients navigate the often bewildering health and social service systems by addressing the multiple barriers influenced by the social determinants of health. Um, Fitz Volkman is committed to advancing CHW models in primary care settings, and over the last 11 years, she has successfully placed clinical CHWs in all six FQHGs of Benton and Lynn counties. Um, Kelly received her MPH from Oregon State University. Next up is Teresita Lawson. She is a bilingual, bicultural registered pharmacist licensed in New Jersey. 
Her role as clinical pharmacist for Zoo Fall Health Center included implementation of and continued quality improvement initiatives for the Clinical Pharmacy Services Program or CPS program at Zoo Fall. Together with the Chief Medical Officer, Teresita brainstormed strategies to expand and sustain the CPS program through PDSAs or Plan Do Study Act cycles based on the principles for the model for improvement. And she actively advocates for the expand, expanded role of pharmacist. She earned her BS in pharmacy at Arnold and Marie Schwartz College of Pharmacy of Long Island University and earned her board certification in diabetes education in 2011. Last, we have Alicia Gonzalez, who has been with the National Center for Farm Worker Health for 23 years and is currently the chief operation officer. Alicia oversees the provision of training and health center engagement services and leads the development of a comprehensive set of leadership and workforce development training services for health center management and board members. She also leads efforts to provide orientation to health center staff on migrant health related issues and to other organizations serving the farm worker population. Alicia has a master's degree in social work from the University of Texas at Austin. Now, without further ado, I want to kick off presentations and give it to Esli Reyes from MHP Salud. Thanks, Albert. Good morning, afternoon, everyone. My name is Esli Reyes, a program director at MHP Salud. And let's start this webinar by giving a brief overview of what health literacy is, how to identify low health literacy, specifically in diabetes, identify high risk groups, and lastly, see how cognitive and social factors impact health literacy. So let's begin by analyzing what is health literacy. Well, health literacy is a capacity to obtain process and understand basic health information and services needed to make appropriate health decisions. And as we can see in our graphic, understanding information involves a three-step process. Information is first heard, then processed, and then understood to take action. Next slide, please. When there is a misconstruct in this three-step process, we have as a result low health literacy. Low health literacy is an unavoidable barrier to effective patient care for many health professionals across the country. And a way to identify patients struggling with health literacy is noticing some red flags, such as frequently missing appointments, lack of follow through on tests and referrals, or even doctor's visits, incomplete forms, etc., just to name a few. Next slide, please. As we can see here, this is an example of the relationship with low health literacy and its effect on medication use. For example, the inability to name or describe current medication may result in a decrease in adherence. Also, having limited understanding of their medication or side effects results in an increase in medication errors, which we know often tend to produce negative effects on the patient's health. And last, they're also less likely to take medication appropriately and or ask questions to their health professionals, which also contributes to higher risk of mis misinterpretation and errors. Next slide, please. Now, let's look at some broader effects due to low health literacy. In regards to low health literacy, there is a growing body of evidence that shows that compared to those with adequate health literacy, individuals with low health literacy are more likely to inappropriately or infrequently use healthcare services. They also face difficulty following medical instructions, have worse physical and mental health, hence the increased visits to the ER, and they also have a shorter life expectancy. Next slide, please. On this slide, you can see some of the high risk groups for low health literacy. We have individuals low, older than 65 years old, um, recent immigrants and other minority groups, the homeless population, prisoners, and those with low education levels and low income. Something important to keep in mind is that although low health low health literacy is more prevalent in some populations, as we can see on the screen, limited health literacy is seen in all sociodemographic groups. Therefore, a patient's health literacy should never be assumed. And we have different ways to do health literacy testing, and we're gonna be learning some of those as we progress through this presentation. Next slide, please. 
So there are different factors that affect health literacy. We have cognitive factors, which affect the way an individual learns and performs, and it constitutes things like memory, attention, and reasoning. Then we also have social factors that affect someone's lifestyle, such as their educational level, economic status, etc. Here we can see some factors affecting health literacy in the context of diabetes. Some that I want to highlight are culture. For example, some cultures may have certain diets and which we know can have a direct impact in the diabetes control and management of a patient. The other that I would like to highlight as well is communication skills. And this includes the relationship and communication between patient and provider and vice versa. Here specifically, language could be a huge barrier barrier to understanding directions um, to appropriately take care of their diabetes. And lastly, one very important factor is the ability to navigate the healthcare system and access care. And even knowing the services available for them, especially knowing that many patients with diabetes require constant care. And now that I have given a, a very quick overview of health literacy and low health literacy, we will hear from Kelly Volkman, um, who is a program manager from Benton County Health Services. And she will be sharing with us how addressing low health literacy looks from the field and the great things her health center and community health workers are doing. Welcome, Kelly. Sorry about that, I needed to unmute myself there. Thank you, Esley, I really appreciate the introduction and especially the opportunity to share about my program. Next slide, please. Um, as Esley said, and um, was, I was introduced, I'm the Health Navigation Program Manager for our Community Health Centers of Benton and Lynn Counties in Oregon. I have a team of 28 community health workers that we've built over the last 11 years from one part-time grant-funded community health worker, and now all 28 of them are almost completely sustainably funded. Next slide, please. I wanted to give you um, a little taste of the breadth and the depth of our team so you could have a context for what our team does and how the clinical piece fits into our team. And I work best with pictures, so I was hoping this picture would help some of you. We actually um, work across the continuum of services from having 11 of our uh, community health workers actually embedded within primary care teams. They are part of the team. They attend the huddles. They attend all of the team meetings. They have a desk and a uh, cubby that's within the primary care team themselves. We also have a separate team um, that works with social service and access connections with health insurance um, enrollment and following through with that. We have a separate group that works in the schools and we have some that work um, almost exclusively with community organization and advocacy. Next group, uh, slide please. So now we're gonna focus pretty much on a, uh, the clinical community health workers. As, as I said, they are in, integral members of the care team. When we first started, the first, very first um, community health worker that we had was clinical. And it was very interesting because the, at that time, our care teams were not, uh, they didn't understand what a community health worker was and what they could do. And it took about three years before we were able to get really good buy-in from the care teams. Um, but now all of our care teams are very excited to have their own community health worker that works just with them and with their patients. So what they do for the care team is that they help the clients navigate the healthcare system. As Esley talked about in her portion on the health literacy, it's not just about being able to read or write. It has so much to do with being able to navigate the phone systems and how do you get from one doctor to the next. And um, even with things such as transportation and scheduling an appointment that works with the bus system. So it's many different things that make up that health lit literacy including patient advocacy. We have um, our community health workers have the freedom to go with patients to their appointments, whether it's within our own system or whether it's to a, a different system, whether it's a specialty program or maybe up in Portland, which is about an hour and a half away. One of the things that we're going to talk about today, however, is their ability to focus on self-management education and support. Much of it is around diabetes and pre-diabetes, but as we know, um, those two conditions often come with those 
comorbidity, so they may have um, high blood pressure as well as weight management issues. So the kind of self-management support that they give will focus on all of those issues in a general way. Um, next slide, please. So the need was a lack of literacy and language appropriate self-management education. And this came about because our existing community programs were high literacy and English only. We actually, when we first started, we went to our local hospital to say, what do you have, what resources do you have for Spanish speakers? And they looked at us and they said, well, we don't have any Spanish speakers that need this service. And we looked at each other and said, well, maybe you don't have any Spanish speakers who access your service because you don't have any services in Spanish. And we've worked with them diligently over the years to help um, improve that access for our Spanish speakers in the community. At the time, we had very few of our community health center providers that spoke Spanish. And they, in general, no matter which populations they were working with, our providers didn't have time to spend with the clients teaching self-management in the relaxed pace and time frame that our clients needed and using that living room language that was really accessible and felt comfortable and easy to take in. Next slide, please. So the intervention that we used was using those clinical community health workers to provide that literacy and language appropriate education. And because they are not, um, they don't provide billable services. So they're not on that fee for service, got to get this information in in a timely fashion so we can submit that fee. Um, they had the time and the relationships with the community members and they were given the training to provide that intensive self-management education and support. And that includes setting those SMART goals, which are the, um, the ones that help people get from point A to point B in small, measurable, achievable steps. They were provided extensive education and training. And that was, um, I talk about that a little, a little bit later, how that was really important for the providers to get that buy-in. We provided um, training at the local hospitals for the diabetes education classes. We went through Tomando Control and a living well a facilitator training, and then just a lot of time spent following and educating the, each of the navigators, the community health workers, so that they felt very comfortable providing this training. And then we also worked together to de develop a curriculum that they could use so that their teaching was standardized and it gave what the providers were asking them to give. Next uh, slide, please. So the things that they emphasize and work on, they do not talk about the specifics of diabetes, anything more than just a very general, this is what blood sugar is, and this is how it works in your body. What they really focus on is healthy eating and active living. They teach that plate method. They have a whole pantry of plastic food for hands-on learning. And this was actually a dream of mine. I have long dreamt of a team of community health workers that could use plastic food to teach things. And so this is really a dream of mine that has come true. They work with referrals from their um, primary care providers or their registered nurse care coordinator. Again, it's primarily diabetes or prediabetes, but they can also work with those other diseases that come along with that. Uh, the Living Well with Chronic Disease and Tomando Control Suf Salud, they are all facilitators of both of those. We do have about three of our community health workers who are non-bilingual, they speak English only. So they are uh, primarily the living well facilitators. And then again, as I mentioned before, they have that curriculum, that curriculum, excuse me, that is in English and Spanish. Next slide, please. This is just a little snapshot of the um, curriculum. Full disclosure, this is the second iteration. We actually have another uh, further one that's taken the literacy level down another notch so that it's just a little bit more accessible. And the thing that's the most um, helpful is that we make a separate visit for the client to come in and sit with a community health worker. It can be an hour, it can be two hours, whatever the client needs and has the time for. And they are also able to take them, meet with them, not just in the clinic, but if the client is more comfortable in the home or they want to meet at the library, our um, community health workers have that flexibility that they can go to the client if that's what the client needs and wants. Next uh, slide, please. 
So these are some of the resources that our CHWs use. This is a picture up in the upper right hand corner of the plastic food. Uh, they can have, they just have all kinds of different things that they can put together and they use them to help um, the clients create that healthy snack or choose a breakfast food or build a meal for their families. They can bring their, their family in. It's really a good teaching tool for the kids in the family to come and say, oh, this is what I want, this is what I like. Each of the community health workers has, you can sort of see in the very bottom of that picture, there's a little box there with a handle. Each of the community health workers has a box that um, they put their own food in so that each one of them has a, um, a component of that that's, that's theirs that they can each take. So they don't have to share, they don't have to overlap, saying who's, doing, who's using it now, who's using it now. They can each uh, do their own thing, partly because they're all in different sites, but scattered over two different counties. It was a little bit expensive to get that, but we, um, we went ahead and spent the money and it has been well worth it for the return. The CHWs can also go shopping. They can take the students to the, or the clients to the grocery store and help look at labels, um, do whatever it is that the client needs to, to get that healthy food knowledge down. They do cooking demos and classes. And one of the things that's been very helpful and fun has been to provide farmer's market tours. So they um, bring in clients to our farmer's market, teaching them how to use the farmer's market to their advantage. Because in Corvallis, we have um, a very sort of a spendy, expensive farmer's market. It's very wonderful and beautiful, but many of our clients feel intimidated to go and they aren't quite sure how to use it. So we provide, every year we provide a farmer's market tour to show our clients um, how to get their value out of the farmer's market. Next slide, please. So we have a question for you. You can do this with your poll. What are some of the resources that a CHW can use to increase the health literacy of their, of their clients when teaching or supporting chronic disease self-management? And that would be something for me to learn from you as well. What are some of the strategies that your um, clinic uses to, to um, help support your clients. So I'll we'll give you just a minute to answer and then we can take a look at some of those answers. And again, I'm interested in learning from you as well. Mm, I've seen one that says teach back technique and ask me three. They, those are great techniques and I really appreciate that you mentioned them. The teach back technique is, is teaching someone um, a strategy or a technique and then having them teach it back to you so that you really know that they have taken that in and brought it back to them. Ask me three is a really good one that's helping your client know what the three things are that they want to ask their provider because many times we go in to the provider and we've forgotten what it is that we're going to ask. Grocery store tours, that would, those are great. These are all excellent suggestions. Oh, I love them. So I'm, um, I'm hoping that we can maybe post all of these as part of our notes for this because these are wonderful suggestions. I'm gonna take them all back. Thank you so much. Okay, let's go on with the rest of the, um, the uh, presentation. So as implementation, um, like I said before, we were, all of the CHWs were trained extensively on self-management, including a two to three month training and um, supporting and um, shadowing. By, by and with trained CHWs. They work extensively with our registered nurses and our diabetes educators. So they're always being um, supervised and monitored and mentored. Uh, they can, our providers can refer either to the RN, the DE, the diabetes educator, or directly to the CHWs. And then the CHW meets with the client in a separate visit. Next slide, please. Some of our challenges was, as I mentioned before, it was really difficult to gain provider trust in unlicensed personnel. The thing that they kept saying to me was, how do we know what they're doing out there? I don't want them to talk about diabetes. And we totally understand that. In no way do, do our CHWs provide information or education or advice on how to manage their diabetes, other than healthy plate, active living, and ways to um, make smart goals and how to achieve that, whether it be something like increasing your water intake or trying to maybe park further from your office and walking a little bit more each day. And so the other thing that we did was making sure that we had to fight for our space in the primary care pods, but we did it. We fought for that space to be in there and then the providers could see what was happening with the um, CHW and then they felt more comfortable with that. 
The other thing was knowing how much and what type of information to give in a session. Um, I like to think of it as the muffin. How do you eat a muffin? You eat it one bite at a time. And if you think about taking that muffin as information and trying to feed someone that whole muffin at the time, you shove it in their mouth and half of it falls on their face and on their shirt and on the floor. So that the information that's contained in that muffin doesn't ever really get digested and into the client in a way that they can know it and understand it and use it. So our job as the healthcare professionals is to really think about what is it that the client needs to know and wants to know. So what bite of that muffin is the most important bite that we can give them at that one time? Because too much information won't be um, useful for them. Next slide, please. Our successes were that we've had so many clients who've had a decreased hemoglobin A1C, um, BMI, and blood pressures. It's just been so exciting to see. And they monitor their glucose regularly. They can create small goals that they can actually keep. And then they know how to choose food or activity that helps them meet their goals. It's been very exciting to see. And our providers have now nothing but good things to say about the work that the CHWs do. Can I have the last slide, please? And um, I'm, not, I'm just going to paraphrase this. It's a lot of words here. It's just a little case study about Carmen, who was 67 when she came to meet, to meet with us. Her hemoglobin A1C was 9.7. And a, um, a normal uh, hemoglobin A1C is between 4.0 and 5.6. So hers was quite high. It was in the diabetes range. Her glucose was running between 58 and 500, which is way, way too high and way too low. And um, her primary care provider just couldn't get her glucose under control. But the um, community health workers started meeting with Carmen and her family. She referred her to, to different programs. She was able to really work with the family and teach her all, so many things in a way that she was able to understand and process. And after the course of several months, Carmen's um, hemoglobin A1C dropped down to 7.6 and her glucose readings stabilized between 110 and 180. And those are all still high, but they're fairly within range for someone who has diabetes. And it was a really good success story and one that we're really proud of to share. So um, last slide, please. Thank you so much for um, being a part of this story. And I, again, thank our sponsors for allowing me to share. And now I'd like to turn the session over to Dr. Jose Leon from the National Center for Health in Public Housing. Thanks, Kelly, uh, for your great presentation. This was awesome. Thank you, and I am very pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, Teresita Lawson. Teresita will be presenting on behalf of the, uh, the National Center for Health and Public Housing. Teresita has been a key uh, friend and supporter for the last eight years. Uh, I invited her uh, to participate in a health literacy webinar about seven years ago. And later, I had the opportunity to meet her at, at one of our national training symposiums. I was not only amazed by her experience on the front line as the clinical pharmacist at SUFO, but also by her passion to serve the most vulnerable. We've been working together for all these years in a wide variety of topics, such as health literacy, cultural competence, diabetes, uh, aging population and other uh, vulnerable populations, PCMH and the public housing primary care program. Uh, I certainly know that her expertise will be of great value for this live webinar and uh, without further ado, good afternoon, Terry. Uh, seminar. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So let's uh, move on to the first slide of my presentation. So I'm going to be speaking about the perceived barriers to health literacy from, from healthcare professionals, as well as some drivers that affect clinical therapeutic inertia. Uh, the challenges that our patients face with medication related problems and some strategies to help overcome those challenges, especially in the arena of low health literacy. 
I'm going to speak about some patient cases that I'm going to be referring to throughout my presentation. And I'm also going to introduce some of the tools that I used in my practice with Zufal Health Center to help uh, mitigate these strategies, the, the health literacy barrier. So next slide. So basically, we have a number of issues affecting uh, low health literacy, and they can be patient-driven, system-driven, or provider-driven. Next slide. So when we look at these barriers and uh, what uh, healthcare providers in general are, are pointing their fingers at are things like an inadequate knowledge about health literacy, and therefore, sometimes we find ourselves with the inability to identify patients that have low health literacy. Also, another thing that happens is that the communication level between the clinician and the patient may not be a very good match. So we always have to be uh, on top of how we're communicating the message to the patient. Other things that um, providers point to are insufficient system use of tools, uh, primarily to assess the patient education materials that we are giving out. Are they at an acceptable reading level? And I've mentioned some of the assessment tools here uh, for your uh, review. And also a big one, big one is time constraints and lack of resources. Um, they really uh, need to use uh, the, the resources that they have in hand at the time, but also understand that uh, patient screening tools uh, are necessary in order to meet the needs of the patient. Another thing is reluctance to conduct formal health literacy assessments. Uh, they, the, they point to not being familiar with the tools and also an overestimation or underestimation of our patient's health literacy level. So that could really impact what decisions we make, the therapeutic decisions, if you will, on, on, uh, for our patients. And also overall in the professional curriculums, we don't have much health literacy uh, being taught in the professional curriculums. Uh, so I can speak for pharmacy. Um, I know that it is introduced somewhat, uh, but not uh, to uh, a, a level that it should be. Next slide. So here are the drivers and they sort of overlap with health literacy. So with the patient, of course, I'm sure that many of you have recognized uh, that patients have denial and fear of their condition. That's uh, the pretty much a human. Uh, education progression and, and they have uh, issues with self-management. Uh, they may not understand their medication regimens. They may also have cost and resource barriers such as under insurance or no insurance. Uh, big trust issues, um, that can be present in, in, in all patients. So as professionals, we need to uh, really cross that barrier with the patient. And the patient may have lack of support, either they, they may be homeless, uh, or they may not have uh, much family, or they may be alone. Uh, so socioeconomic, uh, psychosocial factors can play a role with patient-driven uh, uh, barriers. Also system-driven, uh, clear guidelines is something that's pointed at in the literature a lot, uh, or their frequency of change. Uh, the use of IT and the lack of algorithms within their EMRs might be absent. Uh, we may not have community health workers, uh, which uh, Kelly uh, spoke so eloquently about, and I can appreciate that because in my practice, uh, community health workers played a significant role in helping to uh, uh, address patient barriers that we necessarily did not have the time to uh, address. 
Uh, there may be poor communications with the staff or lack of training. Uh, the system may not be friendly to, to patients. Um, I don't know if you've ever walked into a, a physician's office where no one says hello. Uh, I have, I know that it exists and that's something that uh, really uh, does not do well with the patient. And the environment itself may not be friendly. Uh, some provider-driven uh, barriers, again, time constraints, I have it at the top of the list because if they don't have time to conduct assessments, uh, well, they need staff support. Um, concerns over the cost, will my patient be able to afford the medication? Is this a reasonable choice for my patient? Under or off, uh, underestimation of our patient's level of health literacy, um, they may have difficulty with ITs and navigating updated algorithms, and they may not be updated. Uh, fear of causing harm, always at the top of the list. Uh, reactive instead of proactive. So I saw this a lot in my practice where patients, uh, we saw them after an ER visit. Um, so uh, really we need to be more proactive in how we address our patients and concerns for patient adherence. Are they accepting their treatment or not? Next slide. So what are some strategies? So with patients, again, if we can find the resources to do the assessments, it's very necessary. Uh, the Realm and the TOFLA are the ones that I'm, I'm familiar with. Um, patient counseling and self-management education, always a biggie and education materials and at appropriate level. I recommend and, and most literature uh, talks about third grade level. From the provider's uh, point of view, addition of resources. An interdisciplinary approach is always the one to go with because it helps filling in the gaps with co-management support. And provider and staff education needs to be ongoing uh, we need to be able to tell or uh, pick up on those red flags that, uh, that were spoken about earlier on and use techniques like teach back in order to be able to know whether we're reaching the patient correctly or not. And medication reviews, referrals to the pharmacist, that also helps fill in the gaps of adequate uh, education when it comes to uh, patient education uh, of medications and medication regimens. And the system we really need uh, to put in clear guidelines, PMPs, uh, we need to look at our patient education materials and be able to assess them. Uh, IHI has a wonderful toolkit. This is their, uh, the link to that toolkit, highly recommend it. Also, uh, putting up visuals and videos seems to be a very good way to help uh, fill in those gaps with patients. A lot of patients are visual. I know I'm more visual, <laughs> uh, so I think that that's a very, very good tool. And uh, communication tools with the staff. So huddles are very, very helpful because they help you prepare for what's coming, for what kinds of barriers are present in your patient panel for the day. Treatment algorithms that are up to date in, in the EMR. And meaningful use of the electronic medical records that supports collaborative and coordination of care amongst uh, healthcare workers and an interdisciplinary approach, of course, that, that involves the whole spectrum of, of healthcare professionals. And we need to promote a friendly environment. Ask me, I'm here for you, help, uh, to, to help you. Next, next slide. So some medication related problems associated with patient outcomes, I'm sure this is not a surprise to anyone. This is medication errors. Um, a few years back, there was a report that named the $200 billion opportunity in recognizing medication errors, non-adherence being at the top of the list. 
uh, would help insure most of the uninsured people in the United States of America. So I think that this is an area that needs attention and it takes time and resources. And some patients have complex regimens that need time to review and evaluate and, and talk about with the patient. Uh, Non-adherence, again, 50% of patients do not follow their drug regimen, uh, despite the fact that we have a, a great uh, arsenal of medications and we can still not reach goal. Uh, this is when that's a red flag that a patient is having an issue. Clinical inertia, I spoke about before. Um, really 50% of us are not reaching our clinical targets uh, uh, because we're not intensifying those regimens. And there are also the case of pain management and drug seeking behavior in primary care. How, how do we effectively deal with that? Um, and, and what I've seen is uh, appropriate referrals to uh, pain management and pain management uh, uh, specialists uh, seem to alleviate uh, that uh, area. And patient safety, always being on top of who's on more than five medications. And, and those people are primarily the high risk group in our seniors. Titration and optimization of, uh, optimization of regimens. Uh, we could look at uh, typical scenarios like newly prescribed insulin or intensification uh, of a regimen, making it more complex, uh, reaching out to those patients uh, that need uh, education on those regimens. And the utilization of standing orders may also help in this arena. And medication costs and, and shortages, we need to be um, uh, fluent in what alternatives and what resources we have at hand. Next slide. So my, one of our strategies and the main strategy really at Zufall was uh, something that we took from the patient safety and pharmacy clinical services. And those are the bubbles that you see here. Uh, those elements were integrated into the clinical pharmacy services program. And of course, uh, the pharmacist patient care process was embedded within those, those bubbles. So primarily with my visits, I did a prospective chart review where I, I would look for those red flags, again, that were spoken earlier about, but it's so important to really recognize and look for those uh, so that we can uh, reach out to the patient or deal with the patient at their level with their barriers. Uh, patient education and counseling by using the teach back, using motivational interviewing was very, very successful. Uh, high touch and frequent follow up was also something that was embedded in, in the program. And the use of acceptable health literacy tools, which I'm going to uh, show you. And also, um, Medication therapy management, of course, uh, retrospective chart and utilization reviews. Well, is my patient adherent or not? Um, have they requested a refill? Have they not requested a refill? So all of these uh, items were included in the strategy. Next slide. So again, the patient care uh, process for pharmacists, if, uh, for those of you that are not familiar, uh, have to do with collect, assess, plan, implementation, follow up, monitor, and evaluate. Um, and the bubbles I've embedded in these arrows where you can see that in the collection of data regarding the patient, there are a number of things that are involved. Primarily, you have to reconcile the medications. There is me uh, patient counseling involved. And of course, prospective chart review and provider consultation and referral if need be. So if you go down these, these arrows, you see that the bubbles correlate with what the patient care process uh, dictates. Uh, the main thing that I wanted to bring out in this slide is that that high touch and frequent follow-up is something that occurs on a routine and on a repetitive basis, uh, depending on the patient case. Next slide. 
So what's a strategy to overcome health literacy? Really medication therapy management. I hate to be all pharmacists, but I'm not all pharmacists. I, I, I agree in the interdisciplinary approach. I think that this is a gap that is filled that addresses health literacy with respect to cost, access, adherence. Uh, we can overcome that clinical inertia and the insecurities that are involved. And we can also identify resources through the process. Next slide. So here's one of my patients. He was a male Hispanic, uh, 49 years old. Uh, the main thing that I wanted to bring out here, and I'll speak about it as I go through, is that the use of the adherence sheet uh, that I utilized in, in our practice was very, very helpful with this patient. He did have a lot of psychosocial uh, issues involved. Uh, he was the head of household. Uh, he had a lot of issues with his children, one of which was diabetic and uh, um, also suffered from opioid um, addiction, unfortunately. So he had a lot of issues. Um, he hated the medication. Uh, he hated the fact that it caused a gastrointestinal distress. Uh, he was also taking it wrong. Um, so this was just uh, from the initial visit with the patient with a brown bag and the adherence sheet, these observations were made where uh, the, the bottle had way more pills than uh, what it should have had. Next slide. Here was my lady from Senegal, Africa. She was a newly arrived immigrant from Senegal, Africa. She was widowed. Uh, she presented at the ER before even being a patient of ours with an A1C of 14%, uh, not knowing what was going on with her, uh, totally, totally afraid and frightened, uh, had no, uh, had a very, very low uh, literacy and health literacy uh, level. And in her culture, uh, women tended to be more meek and not self-reliant. Um, her education um, made a big impact in her life. Um, she did come out of the ER on gliburide, and one of the reasons why she wasn't on metformin or insulin was because of fear. Uh, so patient belief is a very, very important uh, barrier to recognize with our patients. Next slide. So what are some of the barriers that I came across with not just these patients, but most of my patients were side effects, uh, fear of, of getting too low, uh, of gaining too much weight, uh, what are these medications? What are they for? So questions about uh, regimens or fear regarding the regimens was also an issue. Of course, costs were a big issue. Neither one of these patients were insured. Uh, so they relied on the 340B program and uh, the therapeutic options that we had for them. Uh, their lack of understanding and the nature of the nature of their disease really imposed a big barrier and their health and cultural beliefs. For example, uh, my lady from uh, Senegal, Africa thought that insulin caused blindness. And that's also very common in the Hispanic population, which uh, was my main population in, in Dupal. Insulin, needle fear, that's big everywhere. Um, that was also an issue with, with my lady from, from Senegal. Um, that's one of the reasons why she walked out of the ER just on gliburide. We have much better choices than that, but that's what the situation was at the time. And they're frustrated, the patient frustration, like how am I supposed to take these two metformins that are causing me to go to the bathroom 50 times a day uh, and, and uh, correct and, and help my diabetes? How am I gonna do that? And trust issues, uh, do these people really know what they're doing? They're, they're prescribing a drug that's causing me more harm than good. Next, next slide. So one of the areas that we addressed at Zufall was staff training. So this was our training. It was very, very simple. Um, it was uh, introduced in every, every area of our, of our center. So 
The goal after the visit, the primary goal is that the patient should know what their treatment is and what they are being treated for. So the first thing you want to do is say hello with a big smile, eye contact always. Uh, those nonverbal communication gestures are very, very important. Uh, people pick up on the positivity. They also pick up on negativity, I think, more, more so than positive. So it's always important to keep positive attitudes, use open-ended questions. What is, where is, how do you? you know, and, and ask the question, instead of saying, do you have any questions with this, which is really closed-ended, ask the open-ended, what questions do you have for me? And always practice the teach-back method, which Kelly did uh, refer to, extremely helpful. You're tapping into what the patient, what the patient thinks is important and growing from there. And the show me method, which is of course the teach-back. Next slide. Another tool that I found very, very uh, helpful in my practice was measuring uh, the, the assessment belief of the patient. So this was just a very simple uh, four question tool that I put into my encounter where I sort of assessed where is my patient? What is their belief with respect to their, to, to their medication? Is it gonna cause them more harm? Do they think it's gonna be beneficial? Um, do you sometimes forget? So cognitive issues, big, big issue with the seniors in our population. Next slide. And this is the adherence tool that brought up my, uh, my male patient, Hispanic patient, uh, his fear of, of the medication. Uh, he was taking it wrong, so when he brought in his bra uh, brown bag, I saw that the label said twice a day and uh, asked him, how are you taking these medications? And he pointed at the adherence sheet and pointed before breakfast and before lunch. So is the medication more likely to cause distress if taken within three hours? More than likely, yes. So we, we separated that, um, that uh that regimen for him. Uh, so it helps mediate the patient's level of literacy because it has pictures, it has clocks. Uh, some people may not be able to read, but they could look at pictures. Visuals are very, very important. It helped to build the trust with that patient. It facilitated medication reconciliation and min meaningful use of the EMR. So system-wise, it was a great uh, addition to the practice, and it also served as a self-management tool for the patient. Very, very important. Many of our patients uh, used it and put it in, on their refrigerator door. <laughs> Next slide. So collect, assess, plan, implement, follow up, and monitoring. This is our, our evidence-based practice. Uh, with uh, the, the patient knowledge, it, it doesn't prove that patient knowledge and comprehension. It also helps improve self-efficacy. I used a method called the simple method. Um, this is from the CDC noon conference. I have the, re the reference there and it's, it's really simple. You just simplify the patient's regimen as much as you can. Always educate them on the, on, on the medications. Uh, you're always going to be engaging the patient with respect to their beliefs and their behaviors and engaging them in that process and helping them to identify solutions that will help them uh, reach their goals. Uh, the adherence tool was also bilingual. Uh, it used universal symbols and clocks, as I said before. And it also enhances acceptance, which also in turn reduces side effects because the patients accept the, the, the regimen, they understand it better. And it also aligned with the quality improvement initiatives, initiatives for the organization, primarily meaningful use and patient-centered medical home. And it also allowed for a self-management take-home tool for, for our patients, as I mentioned before. Next slide. So again, you simplify the regimen, you impart the knowledge, you modify their beliefs and behaviors, you provide the communication needed to nurture their care and to earn their trust. 
You never, ever, ever want to show uh, any judgment at all. Uh, these people are dealing with a very, very difficult uh, condition with comorbidities. Uh, I, I can't imagine the stress that they're under. And so we need to really, really empathize with our patients and always, always evaluate adherence. And this is what helped with both of my patients that I talked about. Next uh, slide. So this is a big system barrier, I believe, in pharmacy itself. Uh, I know that many of you have gone to the pharmacy, pick up your prescriptions, and you get a bag stapled with 16,000 pages on them, uh, but full of literature. Uh, I know that most of you are just taking the bottles out and throwing away the bag along with the stapled material because it is intimidating. Uh, one of the issues that uh, surrounds uh, this, this barrier is the time constraint that, that is involved in the current pharmacy model, uh, retail pharmacy model out there. Uh, pharmacists don't have very little time face-to-face -face with patients. I was fortunate enough in my practice that uh, I uh, met with my patients on a one-on-one -on -one basis and was able to talk to them uh, for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour sometimes if I need it. Uh, again, uh, communication is important. This system does and is tied to misinterpretation of uh, prescription labels and warning labels. A lot of people don't understand them. So this is just something that I wanted to throw in here because I think it is important uh, to realize the systems that our, our patients are trying to navigate and how important those community healthcare workers are in helping us mediate this barrier. Next slide. This is an example of a patient-centered label that was introduced by the Institute of uh, Medicine back in 2008. Unfortunately, it has not garnered uh, national support as of yet. Um, I think California has instituted it. I'm not quite sure what other states have, but it is not universal, not yet. Um, one of the things that um, uh, it does pull out is a very, very clear uh, regimen instruction on how to uh, take the medication. Next slide. This is just a, a, a read a prescription label tool that I used. Uh, it was integrated across the entire medical center. Everyone taught it. Next slide. And we also taught people on nutrition. Uh, we took the opportunity to address their cultural barriers and they were always happy to find out uh, what cultural foods, foods they could eat. And uh, this was always a very fun thing to do with them. And it was also very effective. Next slide. We also embedded the AADE seven self-care behaviors. Uh, this is an evidence-based system and this was embedded in the EMR and I used it at every encounter with motivational uh, interviewing and it helped us assess patient goals and targets. Next slide. And we also reviewed with every patient the ADA, where do I begin, uh, and the plate method. And every patient took this home, and it is available in English and Spanish. Next slide. So what worked was coordinated interdisciplinary care, community resources, including the caregivers and the family, giving patients more access to their medications, assessing their understanding, partnering and nurturing, frequent follow-up and ongoing staff training. Next slide. So my poll question to you today is what modifications have been successful in your practice setting to help overcome therapeutic inertia to improve outcomes in patients with low health literacy? So let me take a look here. Of course, I'm, I, I see here that some people uh, would like uh, copies of my PowerPoint presentation. I'm pretty sure that those are going to be um, uh, going out to you. I had a face-to-face -face, uh, encounters. One of the questions here is, was the high-touch frequent follow-up done by phone or in person? 
it's hard to get patients to come into the office. Well, one of the things that uh, was true about my practice was I was free. So patients didn't have to pay for my services. Um, and that's one of the, the, the issues that helped to get patients into the office. If they didn't see their PCP, well, they saw me. And then I made sure that they saw their PCP. So thank you, everyone. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Alicia Gonzalez. Uh, so thank you very much. And take it away, Alicia. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be part of this panel. I want to thank my colleagues on this panel for the great information that they shared with all of us today. And if we can, there you go, the next slide here. Um, I will be joining my, my coworker, Gladys Carrillo, on this part of the presentation. And we're going to be summarizing some strategies to improve health literacy in your healthcare setting and, um, and sharing some resources and some tools that we hope that you will find um, useful to the work that you do. Next slide. Both Gladys and I work with the National Center for Pharmacor Health, and as said in the earlier introductions, we're one of 20 national cooperative agreements, and we provide training and technical assistance to community and migrant health centers throughout the country. And of course, we work really closely with those health centers that are serving agricultural workers and their family members. So I encourage you to visit our website following um, this presentation for, to get to know a little bit more about NCFH. Next slide. As I mentioned, Gladys and I will be just sharing some tips to improve health literacy. Some of those tips have been shared um, through the other panelists today. So I'm gonna be highlighting some of those and adding some additional strategies to think about in terms of your verbal communication strategies. Briefly, I'm gonna to touch upon the importance of, of the written materials that we provide, why it's important to, to um, create them in plain language. And we, we've already heard about the importance of images and visuals to those. And then lastly, we wanna hear from you as well around what are some of those um, particular strategies that you're doing to address health literacy, especially in, in, in special and vulnerable populations. Um, and around the diabetes care that you provide. Next slide. So we can all agree just based on today's conversation that you know health literacy, the impact is great for the populations we serve. We can all agree that this is a, a critical public health issue that transcends across race, gender, age, income, and geography. So we know that there's a lot of work to be done around health literacy and really thinking about those specific strategies that we can put in place to help our patients be able to to you know, navigate the healthcare system, as we have already heard. You know, what are some strategies we can put in place to empower our patients and have them well informed to the best of our ability? So that's what I'm going to be highlighting in the presentation today. And so we've heard from the previous panelists around risks, and we know that um, there's risk around across all of the patients that we serve. But if we think about diabetes and the complexities of that, there's additional challenges. And, and, and if we think about special and vulnerable populations like, like agricultural workers, we have to think about that in that context as well, occupation. And I also think about um, those folks who are homeless as well. So having to look at all of these strategies through that lens becomes really important. Next slide. I wanted to highlight some of those necessary health literacy skills that, of course, patients need and we all need as we function in a healthcare setting. But as I as I cap, as I highlight some of these skills, I also want to challenge us as healthcare providers to think about how can we influence our systems as well. So while it is important that the patient has to communicate with providers verbally and sign forms, for example, and and understand diagnoses and treatment. How do we set up our infrastructure and our systems to do that? I've worked with quite a few health centers around the country to look at health literacy and cultural competency. And I have found that some health centers are really successful in creating um, committees that look at quality improvement 
And if you think about class, the cultural linguistically appropriate service standards, this fits really nicely in the work that that committee can do. So how do we ensure that we do provide the information that our patients need around diabetes you know, prevention and, and management? How do we ensure that they're able to navigate our own healthcare institution? You know, we have to think about our signage and the forms and the instructions that we give our patients. And so not only navigate internally, but also navigating externally. So a lot of critical skills to think about, and my colleagues have shared the, the importance, for example, of following the medication regime and understanding treatment. Those are all critical skills that I wanted to summarize here or, or reemphasize. Um, and so as we think about this in context of diabetes prevention and treatment, um, you know, a patient has to think about, you know, how, what does glucose level mean, the blood sugar level, how do I monitor that, how do I understand the medications that I have been given, you know, what about my insulin, and if we think about migratory um, populations or um, agricultural workers who migrate, um, to harvest and go throughout the country. What does that mean for them in that context? Understanding how do I keep my, my medication safe that, so that I'm able to take them effectively become really critical as we think about our communications. Next slide. I'm gonna start reviewing some strategies think about, and I want to go to the next one, there you go, strategy one, just the use of universal precautions. We were just hearing earlier from our colleague about how important it is to assess um, a patient's literacy level, and we know there's a lot of challenges with those tools. A lot of providers not, may not know about those tools. They may be just challenging to use. There's not enough time. So if we think about using universal precautions, we think about, you know, this will mitigate the use of having to use some of those assessments. Um, we're going to operate on the premise that health information in general is just complicated. It doesn't matter how educated we may be or how familiar we are within a healthcare setting. When you are sick, health information becomes complicated. When one is sick, we want to feel better right away. And so our stress and our anxiety may, may be very high, as you know. So therefore, that clouds our understanding of information and being able to process that information and more importantly, being able to act on that information. So we have to assume that everyone has difficulty because of that reason. So what do we, what can we put in place system-wide to help our patients be able to um, to share with us that there are some 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 um, issues but how do we train our patients to observe that that we do you know what are those clues and cues that our patients give us when there is limited literacy so that's a really important uh, important strategy to think about. It's just using that, that universal precaution that um, we all need health information in a very simple, simple um, format. Next slide. Strategy two talks about creating a shame-free environment, which is really important when we're thinking about health literacy. Um, if you if you think about the question, I'm sure you've heard this question. It's, you know, do you um, do you have difficulty reading? more than likely your patients are not going to answer that or they're not going to say yes to you. And so given that, how do we ensure and how do we create the space that patients feel comfortable with us to say, I really don't understand? You know, how do we create that warm, respectful space? What does that look like in practice? So giving our staff some tips on what does that mean for this health center organization, or this health center, for example. You know, when a patient checks in, we're going to do this. You know, we're gonna check in and make sure that they don't have any questions or we're gonna review those forms. So really important to think about our quality assurance strategies in this regard to help create that shame-free environment. And how do we train our staff to practice that, that empathy and sympathy and that understanding that that we will have patients with limited literacy and that is okay next slide 
And this kind of goes hand in hand with creating the shame-free environment. And it's, the, it's about empowering and educating our patients. This is key. I love the term dual responsibility, while the providers have a very, obviously a very key role in ensuring that their patients understand the diabetes diagnosis and know how to take medications and you know, how, you know, what they need to do in terms of exercise and nutrition. It also, it's also a big part of the patient's responsibility. So we have to ask ourselves as providers, and when I say providers, I mean all of us as part of the, the, the team, the team, promotoras, community health workers, and case managers, how do we make sure that we are providing our patients with all the resources they need at their fingertips and the services that they need? And so we have to do our due diligence in making sure that we are educating our patients um, of all those services, their treatment, their diagnoses, how to navigate the healthcare system, and ensuring that they're and that they do have the right resources. And I'll speak a little bit more about that um, in the next few slides. Um, right here, this, is, this goes hand in hand with some of the things that I know my colleagues had mentioned and I was noticing in the chat, someone mentioned using this as a strategy, which is a great strategy. It's the Ask Me Three. And so as, as a, health interaction is completed, we want to make sure that the patient walks away really understanding the problem, in this case, the diabetes diagnosis, what do they need to do, okay? So again, it goes to the action-oriented message. We want to make sure that if, if, you know, as we know, nutrition and exercise, for example, are really important as part of the treatment plan, having those specifics around nutrition and exercise become really key. And you want to be able to use like the teach back method, which we heard already about. Um, we wanna use that method as a way for the patient to articulate that. And also more importantly is the context. Why is it important for me to do this? You know, of course we wanna do it because we're gonna improve our health and our health outcomes, but we also wanna be around, right? for our family and so putting that into context during our communications become really key next slide I'm going to just briefly talk about the importance of verbal communication. Now we can hear we hear a lot about you know the teach back and plain language which are very key parts of clear communication. Um, and we might think, you know what, communication is it's basic. We all know how to communicate right we're perfect communicators. As we are communicating something, especially when we know that a patient has limited literacy and there's a lot of stigma and shame attached to that, we really as providers want to be mindful of our tone of voice. Our tone obviously can speak volumes. And while we need to speak slowly and while we need to only identify those main concepts that we want to share that are, that are key for treatment and management, you know, we need to be mindful of how we say things and, um, and, and, you know, choosing our words wisely become really important along with, you know, the plain language. You want to be able to, we want to be able to share information in a way that, that if they were sharing it at home with a family member, they're, they're easily able to articulate it. So just some, some um, key things as reminders that I know that some of our panelists already shared and just being mindful with, um, you know, in our healthcare culture, we tend to use a lot of acronyms, for example, and, and different health programs that are very common and very familiar to us. And if we think about, you know, the diabetes space, we talk about DPP a lot and DSME, Diabetes Prevention Program, and diabetes self-management education, um, being very mindful of the use of those acronyms when we're working with, with patients with limited literacy. So I just wanted to highlight some of those as well. Next slide. Some other practical strategies. I will not spend too much time on this because we've talked about the teach back method as being key, chunking and checking, you know, summarizing and, and checking for understanding throughout an interaction. So while we said we need to speak slowly and identify just key two to three concepts, taking a step back and taking a break and just stopping and pausing and pausing for clarification. And again, never ask, do not ask, do you understand? Um, because more than likely, you know, they will not, they will not say that or share that. Okay, next slide. Um, I'm gonna shift into 
um, writing just very, very quickly. So we know the importance of the verbals and we also know the importance of writing information. And we were just talking about, um, my colleague on the panel just talked about how it's important to use, you know, the right, the right literacy level and the right, you know, think about our, our um, visuals as well. So I want um, you to think about all of the information that you provide um, to your patients, okay? All the instruction forms and there's consent forms, you know, and, and um, then there's the diabetes education that we provide. Um, this is a great exercise for that committee that I was sharing with you earlier that health centers have. Um, some of the quality improvement committees will look at, you know, let's, let's just validate and let's verify if the information we're providing is really in line with the patient population that we're serving. Um, and so a good way is to review and assess it and of course test it if you have time um, to do that. Next slide. Um, so just to reiterate some main points, what is the goal? Um, for mobile populations or populations on the move, I know that you know healthcare workers are challenged with this may be the only time I see this patient. Therefore, I want to give them all the information they need because I don't know when I'll see them again. Um, but again, if we think about the definition of health literacy and the goal is to not only give them, you know, all types of information, but it's really about what do I need to do to manage my condition? You know, if we want them to make sure that they take the medication or the insulin the right way, then, then our written communication needs to, needs to state that. Now, I know that there's a lot of populations that, that may not read. And so how do we then provide that critical information verbally? The way we would use these strategies in a written format, those are the strategies we need to use also again in our verbal communication. So um, when we write um, um, this information, we want to be concise. We want to aim for, you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth greeting level. And there are tools that you can use, you know, in your, in your Microsoft you know, office program, there's a quick way that you can look at the, the reading level of the products that you're trying to put together. So that's just one, one thing that you can do. So again, are we writing our information in the right um, language and cultural appeal? You know, we want to appeal to the, to the populations that we're serving. Next slide. So we have a question that we would like to ask you. What are some clues, and you can write this down in the chat feature, what are some clues that you're noticing or that indicate to you that your patient needs assistance or has not clearly understood what you've communicated, either verbally or written? So what do, what do you usually see in your setting? Mm -hmm. So coming through the chat box right now, Alicia, I've had a comment that says individuals not taking medication or clients saying that providers didn't help them, a lack of interaction, communication questions, patients usually saying yes, yes, without answering the question, being unable to teach back information or demonstrate it, okay. looking away, blank stares, excessive head nodding, Mm -hmm. Great. All great clues. And, um, and this is why it, it's just so critical. It just reiterates the need for the training. And I'll talk a little bit about workforce development in a little bit. But just really the importance of how do we share that amongst all of our team that our patients do have they do have difficulties. How do we share those clues and cues? Um, my colleague earlier was just talking about the importance of doing the huddles. We should be talking about those kinds of things during our huddle. And yes, you know, um, patients won't say anything to you. They may be shy or avoid it. Again, I can't reiterate enough the importance of creating that, you know, that, that environment of trust and that 
and that shame-free environment. So thank you all for your responses. The next slide here, as I was mentioning the importance of writing materials, I know that for many of you in the healthcare setting, you probably don't have time to write and really look at some of these strategies. And I know you're probably using a lot of materials from a lot of different sources. We have a checklist and we're going to link it here in the, the chat so that you're able to download it. It's a checklist that you can use if you do have a committee or your outreach workers or your promotoras, if they're equipped to be able to look at all of your patient instructions and, and your forms, you can look at some of these things and say, you know, do we have that? Yes or no? Or you can make a comment, you know, I think we really need to modify this. So again, the, this is an internal tool um, that you can use to carefully look at the appeal, the cultural appeal, the writing style, really key to think about, am I writing information that's in a, in, in a plain language? Is it an active voice versus passive? That's really key. Um, sometimes you don't really think about passive voice until you actually see something written and it's not real clear on what I need to do. You have to sometimes read between the lines. So this is just a tool that you can use to assess, yes, no, I'm achieving that, and what we need to do to modify that. So I wanted to share that with you as a resource. Um, the next slide, I said I was going to mention training your workforce. Um, the previous panelists also talked about the training that they're doing. I cannot emphasize this enough, um, why it's important um, to do this. There are some, and I think someone in the chat mentioned the, um, the American Medical Association. They have a, a, a video, there's a short version of it on YouTube, and there's a longer version. I have worked with a lot of health centers who have used it, and they have found it to be very helpful. I like to use it, and I encourage others to use it. It's on YouTube. Um, my colleague Gladys has just um, put the link to both versions here on the chat. It's just a great introduction to what the health literacy impact, what the impact is, and it really highlights some personal stories of how people struggle and some of these great strategies. So I really encourage you to think about think about using that during you know some some lunch and learns if you have that or doing during some of the huddles it's a great way to just just to kind of reinforce some of these great strategies that um, that we are talking about um, and just the American Medical Association if you just google them they have a lot of great information around health literacy um, that you can access the next slide I wanted to share with you as well, we, um, our previous uh, panelists spoke about assessments and the challenge with assessments and how critical they are. Um, here's one that I wanted to share with you, the newest vital sign, um, and I believe that I saw some folks talking about it as well on the chat feature. This is one of the first tools that was available to assess health literacy in English and Spanish, and they've made some, some additional um, um, changes to it, but it's a way to use a ice cream label as a way to assess one's um, patient uh, or health literacy rather. And so I will not go into the details of this literacy assessment, but we have attached this implementation guide. It's a great implementation guide. It, is, it tells you exactly how to implement it. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but this was a tool that was developed by Pfizer back in like early 2000, uh, 2011, I believe. And like I mentioned, it was, it has been modified since, but it's a great tool and it's, it's, it's really quick to do. It takes like three to five minutes. So for those of you who want to really, you know, find out more clearly, get a better picture of the populations that you're serving, this is a way to do that. So I encourage you to just take a peek at it and it's, it's up here now and you're able to download it off the, um, from the materials section. Okay. Next slide, and now I'm going to turn it over to Gladys, my colleague, who's going to um, share some last minute information with us. Gladys. Thank you, Alicia. I appreciate the segue. And thank you, everyone, for sticking around. We're going to go over a few more minutes, but we're almost close to wrapping up. So I'll just um, come to this last practical strategy that we have here, where we encourage health centers to really consider creating community partnerships with organizations within your service area 
and or organizations that connect in similar values that you're trying to convey or services that you're trying to provide to your patient population. Um, collaborating with partners can help mitigate any shortage of financial resources or budget constraints that health centers are often challenged with. It could also open the potential for new programs and new ways of delivering services, especially for medication assistance in order to increase patient adherence as our previous panelist Teresita had indicated. Not only that, it could offer different methods of service delivery in being able to provide um, services in different settings and through different platforms. So creating partnerships can definitely be a great way for you to network and promote the services within your community populations and be able to just raise awareness about the services that you provide. Next slide. In doing so, raising awareness and, and providing information about your services can further promote trust within your patient population. Now, this is definitely something that's already been um, touched upon by one of our previous panelists, but we cannot emphasize how important creating trust with your patients is and how it could actually help in improving health outcomes by them being more engaged in their treatment and in services. Creating partnerships can further reduce uh, social determinants of health that create challenges and barriers for patients. And this is anywhere from transportation, including health literacy as an issue, but it could be language, it could be financial issues, a whole number of things that are related to social de determinants of health that definitely impact a patient's access to care. And more importantly, um, being able to create relationships can help a patient's understanding of the healthcare system and raise awareness of available resources, like I mentioned. Next slide. All of this obviously is done in connection uh, in being able to increase access to care. And this just leads me to talk a little bit about our efforts with the Ag Worker Access Campaign and CFH has uh, led efforts with this campaign since 2015 when the campaign was launched. And in collaboration with the campaign task force, we continue to encourage everyone to join the campaign and be able to uh, be a part of this momentum in serving vulnerable and special populations, including agricultural workers and individuals impacted by chronic illness like diabetes. Next slide. So we'll wrap up here by taking one final poll question of the strategies that we discussed, which one do you currently utilize at your health center or which one would you like to start implementing at your health center in order to improve health literacy? So we'll give it about 15 more seconds for you all to take the poll and then I will launch the results for you all to see. Thank you, Albert. Okay, well, it looks like strategy three seems to be the most popular in terms of empowering and educating patients. So being able to use that strategy effectively can help improve patient outcomes and even reduce the, the patients impacted by health literacy. Thank you all for your feedback. So onto the next slide, as I mentioned, creating partnerships can definitely also be a valuable resource NCFH has actually collaborated and partnered with the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists, formerly known as AADE, on a number of different projects. Um, I note that Asita hinted to their self-care behaviors as an evidence-based model. Um, we have actually also collaborated with ABSIS in creating a learning collaborative that was supported by HRSA to further the knowledge of health centers in developing and implementing diabetes self-management training and diabetes prevention program. So through that partnership with ABSIS, and CFH created and launched this Diabetes Resource Hub, which you'll see here, and we greatly encourage you to come and visit on our webpage. 
it houses a number of different resources and tools available to you in terms of being able to provide information in order for patients to prevent, manage, and treat prediabetes and diabetes. Next slide. NCFH has also recently developed a web page specific to COVID-19, considering the pandemic that we're currently all being impacted by. We launched this web page um, recently with a number of resources again that um, a lot of different organizations have provided information on the impact of COVID, what it is, how to prevent the spread, and be able to manage any potential symptoms individuals that um, patients may be experiencing. So along with that, NCFH actually recently launched a webinar series that we're going to be um, moving forward with and launching this Wednesday, actually. Um, it'll be talking about um, a this research sharing and discussion with the frontline staff. Um, so we encourage you to check that out. And if you haven't registered, if you get a chance to register, I'll put in some information in the chat box for you all to do so. Um, the webinar, like I said, will begin this Wednesday and will be every Wednesday through April 29th. We will have a specific link uh, or webinar in particular to the diabetes population and that will take place on April 29th from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Next slide. So as um, I mentioned, NCFH also has a number of different uh, resources on our webpage, not just in particular to diabetes management, but also to just being able to support health centers across the country in having patient education materials available to you. We house a number of digital stories that we've developed throughout the years in particular to different topics such as diabetes, hypertension, anxiety. Um, we've even had digital stories created in particular to workforce training. So if you haven't had a chance to look at those, I would encourage you to check out our website. Um, our resource page houses all of our different um, products and uh, support services available to you all. Next slide. Thank you. I'll go ahead and pass it back to um, Albert. Great. Thank you so much, Gladys, Alicia, uh, Jose, Esley, Kelly, and Teresita. This was a jam-packed session. As you can tell, we are going over time, and there are a lot of questions that came through the Q&A pod, which have already been answered by our speakers. So I want to thank our speakers again for acknowledging the attendees' um, questions, which we will make available and put into a nice document um, and upload to the diabetes.appshow.org website under session three. So um, stay tuned for more follow-up around the Q&A. So just wanna quickly acknowledge that the post-webinar survey will be available once you leave the meeting, um, especially if you want the CMEs and CNEs, you'll need to answer question nine on the survey and indicate which um, version, if it's a hard copy or an electronic copy of the certificate, um, our colleague and Martha from Migrant Clinicians Network will be um, completing those by April 21st. So stay tuned for more information as long as you give us your email. Uh, last, we have our webinar next Tuesday to close out this series, and it's going to be focused on pillars of community engagement. And that'll be um, led by four national cooperative agreements, including APSHO, Migrant Clinicians Network, School-Based Health Alliance, and the National Nurse-Led Care Consortium. So we'll close out this series with a bang next Tuesday, same time, same place with the Zoom. Um, you can register again at diabetes.apsho.org if you haven't already. So with that, just want to thank um, our speakers again for um, their time um, and your subject matter expertise. Um, this was a great um, session to close out the health literacy strategy under our continuum of care framework. So you can learn about this series again at our website and you can email the speakers and faculty members using the email address here on this slide. So with that, I uh, want to thank you all again and um, see you next Tuesday.